Welcome to the Safe Business Agility Podcast. This is the place to get advice, stories, perspectives, and updates about safe and related topics to help you work differently and build the future. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Today's guest is Steve Adolph. Steve is a coaching consultant with C Prime, a Morgan Stanley company. Uh, beyond all that, I don't want to make him sound too stuffy. Steve's a great guy. I've had the privilege of quote unquote mentoring him for the last year, but truth be told, throughout the course of our relationship, I've learned a lot more from him than he ever learned from me. And I hope through this episode, you're able to really understand the depth of knowledge that he has in the experience and just the kind of person that he is. We talk a lot about architecture and leadership and a little bit of humility at the end. So I hope you enjoy this with Steve. He's a great guy. We can all learn a little bit from him. Steve, before we get started here, I got to give you a hard time. <laughs> and you already know where this is going. Oh, dear. I, the, 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 do we have to go there? <laughs> Steve, it's rude to bring gifts to some and not bring gifts to all. Is this what I can expect from my Canadian counterparts? No, no. Okay. Well, it, it's just that, how shall we say, I wanted to, I, we had a whole scheme where we wanted to have lots of fun with Joe because he's always trying to give Canadians such a hard time. Which is unfair. Yeah. And, and, and he does, and he, to be honest, he does it in great, in great humor. And, and so, you know, you saw us there with our Canadian hockey jerseys on and we brought the Canadian whiskey and we had the, and we had the, we had the photo opportunity with him and Joe looking like, oh my God, what's happening to me? So the, the, it, the, the intent was to have that moment with him and then That's share fine. the whiskey with everyone. That's fine. You know, I, it's too late now, but I think the best way to cap that off, do you know what a Snuggie is? No, what is a Snuggie? So is, a Snuggie is one of those things they sold on late night television for nineteen ninety nine for a lot of years. It's a blanket with a hood and armholes. And you could get them in all sorts of fun designs. And I think the best gift for Joe would have been a Snuggie with the Canadian flag. Oh, I love it. Summit's coming up. Just, just saying. <laughs> Steve, now that we've sufficiently confused people, why don't you tell them who the heck you are, what you do, and what we're here to talk about today? So um, I'm Steve Adolf. I'm, as you've probably guessed, I'm from Canada, actually West Coast of Canada, beautiful Vancouver. Uh I am a newly minted SPCT, and I'm also sitting here with my guide, Adam, who I am entirely grateful for the help that he gave me. I'll stop. You know, I learned more from you than you did from me. And oh. just to be clear, this is a test. <laughs> what does SPCT stand for, Steve? Not what it stood for two weeks ago. What does it stand for today? Okay. That's actually a really good question because it's a wee bit up in the air. We do know that it's a safe practitioner uh, consult, consultant. S safe practice consultant. Pr safe practice consultant. With T-shaped skills. With T-shaped skill. But now it gets really interesting. What does the T stand for? T-shaped skills. T-shaped skills. Yeah. And there's going to be a really cool animation on the web that really articulates that. I, I will say that when we updated the branding, our goal was, you know, our SPCTs five years ago were focused primarily on training. And as all of our skills have evolved and the work that we do has evolved, the market has recognized us to be a lot more than just trainers, right? And we all do a lot more than that. Um, transformation architecture is a big piece. How do we help organizations define their why? What's the problem to solve? And then how do we get there in a responsible, sustainable, empathetic to change sort of way? We serve as trusted advisors, right? We're all coaches, consultants, and probably somewhere in the middle of those two, right? We all have our natural disposition. I think you're probably more natural a coach with consulting skills. I'm definitely a consultant with the ability to be a coach. And then we're, of course, trainers and a lot of other things. And when we were updating this branding, I swear to you, I looked through every word in the English language that began with T and a few other languages to try and find another word to replace trainer that made sense, there's not one. There's I tried. Not, there's not one, but I think the one of the considerations I loved and what was considered, and this is what I this is how I see myself as a trusted advisor. You know, sometimes I get asked, "What do I, what is it I do for a living?" And the way I like to answer that question is, I go tell amazingly smart people 
who know everything about their job, how to do their job. And it's a respect, and it's a bit of a choke, but it's also a respect for the people I work with because I get, that's one of the coolest parts of this job. I get to work with some amazing people. And I look at, my role is to be a trusted advisor to help them enjoy their job more, achieve flow, achieve better outcomes. And that's kind of why I like the, the idea of the trusted advisor because to me that covers what I do as a consultant, what do I do as a coach, and what do I do as a trainer? It's great stuff, man. We're, we're all evolving. Um, and I think these are some pretty positive steps in a direction that makes sense for, for pretty much everyone in this community. So what is it that you want to do explore today, Steve? I like the, It's a passionate topic of mine. It's the role of the architect and architecture, particularly the role of the architect in SAFE and, what, and the guidance it provides for people in an organization. Let me ask you a leading question. When you say the architect in SAFE, do you mean to imply that there's one architect? No, that's actually, that's actually a great clarification because the one thing that comes across in SAFE is, of course, across the multiple levels, there are, mul- there are multiple architectural roles depending on the scope of their responsibilities and leadership. I mean, that's absolutely right. You know, people look at it and they look at what we affectionately refer to as the Troika, right? So you've got your RTEs, you've got your product managers, and you've got your architects, right? But it's not necessarily a single human, depending on your context, that could be a pool of people with different architectural responsibilities. Exactly. Right. So when you think of that architectural community, right, let's, let's focus, I guess, on the micro and then go to the macro. So when you think of an art, what are the architectural perspectives that you think most organizations need to be considering when they pivot to solution development? I think it's not so much that when they're pivoting to solution development, I think it is really understanding the role of the architect and within that. Because here's, here's, the, here's the challenge I see. The term architect is usually used as an honorific for the subject matter experts on that, on the, within the teams and within the arts. But one of the key things when we're going through that transformation and we look at that triad of the, you know, of the RTE, the product manager, and the architect, that's implying in a very important leadership role that the architect is taking on. And I think that is actually the most important aspect of all the architects we have in that train is that when you take on that role as an architect, it's not just being a subject matter expert anymore. You're taking on a leadership role. So let's, let's look at that, right? So we mentioned that group of, of three people or perspectives, but those three have different component responsibilities to achieving the outcome. Exactly. So the RTE helps make sure that the, building engine, right, is running efficiently and smoothly. You've got the product management responsibility who's focused on where are we going? How do we evolve our solution to let our customers next, right? What does the future state look like at many different horizons? And then you've got the architecture responsibility considering that what if from product management, also the current state and trying to plan deliberately in a scalable, maintainable, secure, pick your illity, right, way, how do we achieve this vision in a way that allows us to continue to build in, in a sustainable way, right? So we don't get this architectural rat's nest that a lot of folks have now. Exactly. But there is multiple ways to achieve that. And you, know, you go back to safe principle number nine, right? What is it, Steve? And that is to de- delegate decision-making. And that applies to architecture as much as it applies to the process role given by the RTE and their relationship with the scrum master, as much as it applies to the product management and the product owners on the team, right? Because that's how we get speed. So how do we do that, Steve? So if if we want to decentralize these architectural decisions, how do we do that in a way that prevents duplicative work, that creates duplicative processes, that that prevents hard-coded this and that, right? How do we make sure that if we're all making decisions, we're making decisions in the same direction? So that goes back to all the basics again. We take principle number nine, clear intent. 
setting the vision, right? That's always what we talk about so much is, you know, at the, you know, at the portfolio level, at the solution level, at the art level, it's all about, you know, one of the most important things is establishing the vision. Do you all understand what we want to achieve? Same thing applies to the architect. Here is what we plan, how we plan to evolve the architectural runway. And it's also giving the guidance to the teams. Here are the architectural patterns. Here are the architectural frameworks that we have. And, though, and do you clearly understand their usage? What I'd like to say is being able to do that in a way that we can maximize the emergent design, right? We, we talk in SAFE about the balancing between intentional, intentional architecture and emergent design. And my view is that the real role of the architect is to get that development speed. Local decision-making gives you speed. The real intent of the architecture, systems architect role, solution architect role, is to ensure that our teams have it clearly understand, here's the intent, here's the patterns. We're going to set down some intentional architecture to liberate your creativity within your team, you can maximize the emergent design. You have these guardrails that we've set down. The opposite of that is what we traditionally see, and that is the centralized architect, the architects in the back room, and the architect as a compliance officer. I've literally been at clients where the architects review the store at the story level. Oh yeah, I've, I've been at clients where the architect estimates all the stories. Exactly. If you're a senior engineer on a team, is that what you really want to be doing? Well, I'd venture to guess that you're not going to have any senior engineers on the team because no one's going to stick around for that. Exactly. You know, that's just not what you get into this business to do. To basically, you know, be the compliance officer uh, for that team. So let's talk about those guardrails because I think that's, you know, if you're in an organization that had a strict architectural review board, right, and you had historically been put in a position where you had to review and approve all the things or else, right? So when you're pivoting from that context to one where you want to give intent and get out of the way, we want to make sure that we have sufficient guardrails that allow us to move forward in an intentional and responsible way. What sort of guardrails do you think are, you know, and you also mentioned compliance, right? So there's the piece of it that is, we need to be compliant for any one of a hundred reasons. We have to meet data privacy protection standards. We have to meet coding standards. Um, and we want to make sure that we're being good stewards of data and that we're pulling data appropriately and pulling data appropriately. It's a lot, right? So, and if you're a developer on a team, it can be overwhelming. So what are those guardrails that you typically see architects provide that are enough without being too much or too little? How would you coach that? You know, it's it, sometimes I take a page from, uh, you know, the guardrails we have on uh, portfolio funding, right? We, we, have a, we have our horizons. We have business, business owner involvement. I look at it in some, in some, you know, analogously what I would expect the, ar the architect, you know, equivalent to saying that we have funding, you know, we have funding horizons. As I mentioned, People on our team should be well-versed in what are the acceptable patterns of implementation? What are the available APIs that we have for implementing? How do we access data? What is our guidelines for security? What is our guidelines for data management? What are our guidelines for reliability? Those are definitely, those are definitely things when we onboard someone onto a team, they should be well aware of. It is also a big part of the role of the architect to help coach the team on how to make sure that people do use that. And that's what I see the understand those guidelines because something that's going to be an absolute speed killer on a team is people going, am I doing this right? So I think I, what I hear you suggesting, and please correct me, is I, I hear you suggesting that the architect is co-creating the NFRs with the team to help the team figure out based on our context, right? What are the standards that we have to meet? What are the considerations across the spectrum that we have to look at? Um, and then also, maybe it's a little bit of guidance in how we want to start reducing technical debt, maybe being more modular in terms of how we design and build to get out of the problems that we have. Well, exactly. I'd look at the architect role gain leadership and leadership to me means mentor, teacher, advisor, being able to unleash the team 
such that they are confident that they can make it, they can make local decisions and that they're not having to wait for wait for an architectural review board they're not having to wait for someone else to approve their work because every, so many organizations i see like on a on their kanban board and architectural review here and you just see story after story after story because it just over you know sure. it overwhelms the architect bottleneck. it's a bottleneck and for, for what outcome, right? For this notion of safety. It's it's a false security blanket. Because can you imagine, right? You've got dozens of stories piling up from several teams coming into an architect. What kind of review do you think they're honestly going to be able to give that? Not a great one, right? And if we're making the appropriate investments in our architecture, right, in our pipelines, we should be automating those things, well, right? The things that the architect should be checking for or, or is intended to check for in that scenario, we can automate. Exactly. And this is one of the things that I really, you know, you know, first of all, one of the reasons I got really drawn to SAFE was it was one of the few scaling methodologies. And I think we should be clear, Steve, that you know all of them, right? You've taken the time to investigate and research them all. So you're not saying this from a pragmatic perspective. And I assume that, you know, you recognize where there's certain contexts where other things, you know, work. But I want folks to understand that you're not sitting here as a dogmatic safe person. No. You've dove into everything. You, you've you got credentials in nearly everything. Yeah, because there are so many wonderful frameworks out there. And they all have a place. They all have a place and they all, you know, they're all well-intentioned. And it's, re- it's you know, I always say to people, you know, I happen to like safe. I, I love to joke. Well, it's what pays my mortgage and sends my kid to school. <laughs> but the re, but the reality the reality is, it's a great it's a great approach. But there's other great approaches. You know, I I like disciplined agile. I like the intention behind less. Right. It really you know ultimately to me what it means. What's going to help you as a company? Like what do the, what resonates with you as a as an organization that's going to help you start getting into getting better outcomes getting business agility. I just happen to think personally that SAFE provides the most comprehensive guidance for that. Well, and I think that's a good point, right? It's the way that I look at it and the way I've I've looked at it is, you know, for one, what is the problem you're trying to solve today? Exactly. I think we've all started this way with an agile team in the corner. Well, if someone's coming in and saying, hey, we want to build a really high performing agile team, you're not going to pull SAFE out of the box, right? Because it's just not suited for that intent. Now, as the problems evolve and the different problems to be solved evolve, then the toolbox, you know, you open a little bit further, right? And I think that's the context and the perspective we need to keep is when we're solving or seeking to solve really big problems, when we're seeking to change the way that a business operates at its core, then there's more guidance that you need. And and I think that's an important thing to realize too, is that people sometimes perceive the framework to be rigid and prescriptive. And my counter to that is the framework is inanimate. The culture that is seeking to implement the framework can feel certain ways. And as we all know, working in a faster way, if there's pain in the system, as you move faster, you incur that pain more frequently So thereby the pain that you've always felt, you're now feeling more frequently and you've got a choice. Do you address the source of that pain or do you just continue to incur it? So I guess the point is there's a time and a place for everything and we have to be deliberate about what is the problem we're trying to solve and what is the best tool or subset of tools to solve that problem? Well, exactly. And you know, what I'm working with my clients would say that the one, the one thing that I would argue for that it is definitely safe brings to the table it's a comprehensive knowledge base. It is an, and I, it's an excellent place to get st- started because once you start getting a large number of teams and you're taking on much l- larger scale initiatives, you do need a lot of guidance to get people aligned. Um, I've, I've been at clients where just something as simple, they try to, especially like doing a do it yourself, just getting the taxonomy together. You know, I may not fully agree with the taxonomy that SAFE brings. But at least we can all agree what it means. And it gives us, every team knows what an epic is. 
Everybody knows what a feature is. Everybody knows what a story. Everybody knows what an enabler is. It gives us a starting point right away and we can train to that. Well, and you can also hire to that, which is an important thing too, is you start to, to, to change and you want to bring in different skills. You don't want to have to teach your own unique language to somebody new. You want to bring someone in who gets it on day one. Exactly. Whereas, you know, when you're starting to do a do-it-yourself number, all of a sudden people are going, well, what is, what's this artifact? What's that artifact? What it, and, and often when there's these do-it-yourself numbers, people are, people are arguing over, these, over the terminology and the taxonomy. And it just creates a lot of confusion that you don't need to add to the confusion already if you're starting to try and transform an organization. Sure. Change is hard enough without adding extra pain. But it's also like I said, safe is not the finish line. Safe is there to get you started to having business agility. You know, we believe that lean flow is a great strategy to achieve business agility. And what Safe does is start that evolutionary process. Like I love, you know, our emphasis on relentless improvement. And, you know, when I look at that implement that implementation roadmap, you know, it really should be, you know, like to infinity and beyond. Sure. Well, and safe isn't the goal, right? Safe isn't the goal. Business agility is not the goal. The goal is something else. And, and I think where a lot of organizations struggle is they don't have that why. They're not anchored in the reason, what the thing is that they're trying to achieve, right? So I, I always kind of tie it back to the idea of uh, I'm a fitness nerd, <laughs> right? I also, like I also like donuts. If I ate a dozen donuts a day, and my doctor said, Adam, stop eating a dozen donuts a day. I would say, no, like, no, I'm going to keep doing that. If the, de- if the doctor said to me, Adam, stop eating a dozen donuts a day, or you're going to die early and you're never going to meet your grandkids. Well, that's a compelling reason to embrace the pain of changing and stopping the amazing dozen donuts that I eat a day, because there's a reason, right? I'm going to go through this journey. I'm going to change. And that thing at the end is worthwhile. And I think a lot of organizations where they struggle is they say, we're going to do, we're going to embrace agile. We're going to do safe. And they stop. There's no why, right? It's the same thing with the architectural patterns, right? We, we need to improve our architecture. Cool. Why? I, I've been the developer of this thing for the last 20 years. Now you want me to change it. So the person over there knows how it works too. No, right? Just no, without a why. Well, exactly. That kind of brings us back to the architecture conversation because one of the things that we tend to forget in architecture, like you know, tradi- traditionally, especially when we have the architect sort of off in the ivory tower back room, is their focus becomes grand, beautiful architecture, right? Textbook architecture, the way we learned it in, 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 in university, you know, how all the, all the good architectural patterns, the high cohesion, low coupling. The one thing we forget is what's the purpose of architecture in an organization? What is it, Steve? It is to enable business agility, full stop. But let's be clear. It's, it's not capital B, capital A, right? It's we need to create the capability for our business to pivot rapidly to meet ever-changing market conditions. Exactly. And when people ask me, what is good architecture? You know, yes, I love to think about terms of, you know, layers and reusable components and beautiful patterns. That's all, those are all just means to an end. Ultimately, my architecture has to be supporting the ability of the business to pivot. New opportunities come up. I need to be able to, I need to be able to pivot and take that uh, advantage of that opportunity. I can't have the, my technology systems impeding me from that. I want to pull you down a rabbit hole. Okay, let's go. Because y- you hit on something that I learned a lot of years ago to be very important. And unfortunately, it typically resides on the other side of the proverbial wall and serves as a competing force. Right. And that's the idea of business architecture. Mm -hmm. When we look at the system of a business, technical architecture is half of it. How the business runs, how the business operates, it's equally as messy, right? We have as much operational debt as we do technical debt. And a lot of that comes from similar areas, right? When we rush a technical project out the door to get it done to meet a date, 
well, we're also rushing its implementation and we have a lot of workarounds. And when we take those solutions to market and we do the go live workarounds, those things never go away, right? So you've got operational people working in a debt ridden environment. You've got technical people doing the same. And we need to bring those, those, those worlds together to understand that it's not how the tech works. It's not how the business works. It's how our system works together. And how do we seek to better understand the whole of the system so we can then optimize the components to work in harmony? Oh, this is, this is absolutely, you're absolutely correct. It shocks me that in the year 2023, how many businesses still think of their IT organization as a utility, a bag on the side? Steve, you want to know the one thing you can do to get my blood pressure higher than bringing bourbon into the office and not giving me any? <laughs> it was Canadian whiskey. <laughs> that makes it a little more tolerable. Okay. At any rate, when I hear people say business and IT, it yeah. makes me want to lose my mind. In 2020, and this is something else I learned that's, that's interesting, right? I, I've always heard those terms in the context of IT, right? It's business and IT. Then I started doing work in marketing. I started doing work in HR. And all these people say the business. And, and what occurred to me was, it's not the business. That's just your customer. Who's your customer? Stop saying the business. Stop saying those words. We are a business. There's not the business, right? So we need to start thinking about, stop using these divisive words and, and just really start thinking about, these are our customers. These are our products. We work together to delight somebody. It's even more integrated than that. I think if you, do you remember the book, The Phoenix Project? I do. And I forget the character's name, but there's a lovely mon, you know, monologue near the end where the sort of advisor talks about the nature of IT and business and refers to IT as being the central nervous system of the business. It is tightly a tightly integrated part. To everything. There is no business today that can operate without its digital systems. Sure. And the digital systems fundamentally change the business processes. You know, you say that, and I had a great example not too long ago. Um, my wife previously, we go through a lot of cars in our house. It's a problem of mine. But she drove an Audi and we were living out here in Boulder at the time. And something simple, right? We took her car in for an oil change to get winter tires put on. A very non digital experience, you would think. But what I get in my text messages is a video from the technician who's doing a whole walk around of the vehicle, showing the wear components, talking us through it. And all of that is integrated into their customer experience platform. The guy's changing the tires and the oil, but it's part of a bigger digital experience that drives brand loyalty. And, and it's things like, I think he was checking for play in my ball joints. And he had, he had um, a graph and it was, you know, red, yellow, green. And if the play in the ball joint was in the green, you were good. If it was in the red, they were bad. For me, it was in the yellow, but I said, you know what? It, it's worn enough for me. Why don't we go ahead and replace that? If he would have just told me, hey, your ball joints are worn. I would have said, you're crazy. The car's not that old, you know, get out of here. But he showed me it was transparent. It was an integrated experience. And as a result, I spent more money. Another example, my mom runs a flooring and furniture store. My stepdad is the least technical human on earth. However, he has traded his tape measure for measuring homes for an iPad with augmented reality that can precisely measure a room for flooring. Everything is digital. Nobody is immune. And if you try to pretend that you are, you're not going to last. No. And so back to the point, right? That's why this is all so important. There is no us in them. There is no business in IT. We are one architectural being we're integrated and the better that we can do at creating elegance in that integration, the faster we'll be and the better experiences will be. Well, absolutely. And it opens up a broader range of possible solution spaces for us. You know, we take that even right. You could even say, you know, to set based design, it gives us more options to consider when an organization wants to bring a new product or service to their clients. What are the, op what are the options? What are some of the MVPs? What can we learn quickly? Because, that's when we, you know, the unfortunate part of this is when we think in that old model, you know, the business and the IT, we're going into the old throw it over the wall because what is going to happen, the business architects are going to work with the BAs. They're going to, you know, we want to provide a new service. 
They're going to write up a whole set of specifications and that's going to get dumped into a backlog. And now the backlog becomes a queue of requirements. Sounds familiar. Oh yeah. You've seen this movie before. From, from the old days. Exactly. Except it wasn't a backlog. It was a massive phone book sized or encyclopedia sized requirements. Stock. Exactly. But instead of a instead of an encyclopedia of requirements, we pretend we've got user stories and IT gets to pretend that it's agile. And then what happens is IT does a little iterative development and we feel very good about ourselves. And then we present, we go through user acceptance testing and we present the system to the business and they're happy and we still ha- we're still not done. We iter- iterated our way through Waterfall. Exactly. So here's the thing. This is what I hear you saying. We need to get better at communicating. We just need to act like we're on the same team and get better at talking. Why is that so hard? I think it's one of the, one of the reasons I just think it's tr- a traditional mindset. You know, look at some of the stuff that we look at what we advocate in, in uh, safe, but you know, just the whole agile community trying to develop that growth mindset. We, for whatever reason are still stuck in a Taylorist model. And even though we say, yes, we have knowledge workers and we're going to, we're going to acknowledge that we've got really smart people working for us. We still have management owning the way that working. You know, what's interesting, Steve, I recently, I'm not going to get into the who, but let's just say that I, I recently read a book and recently, as in when I flew out here on Sunday, um, that dove into the history of modern management models. And, and let's just say that the reason that we follow the models that you talk about as being traditional, the reason that we follow them is because there was no social media. The things that are advocated in those models, in this, the history of how we got into the models, it's not great, right? The, the motivations, the methods, the behaviors, if, if we were a connected society then like we are now, those things in those companies would never have the prominence that we hold them to the esteem that we hold them to today. So I look at that and I think we do these things because they're the way that we've always done them. And and we behave the way that we do because the system is designed to promote a certain behavior that through a modern lens, we would never accept or advocate. And I just think that's so interesting. And it really hit me like a hammer on that flight. And it wasn't the Canadian whiskey. It was coffee. (laughs) But it's just so interesting to me that these behaviors that we are holding on to are the exact behaviors that as a society we want to get rid of. Well, they are. You know, but and I think part of the issue, you know, we can go back to the David Marquet video, right, that we tend to use a lot, right, to turn the ship around or greatness. And there's that wonderful image. He says, it's, you know, changing our style of leadership is hard because we've been genetically programmed, you know, to lead and attract followers. And as he said, you know, our, what we have to do now is turn that around and empower leaders in our organization. And that's what I see the role of the architect is say, trying to empower members of our teams to be able to lead, to take, to maximize emergent design. And, we're fighting that natural instinct because, you know, when you delegate, you, when you delegate authority, just like think, think of us to yourself as a senior engineer and you've got all these young kids on teams, right? They, and, you, and you give it, you know, you're explaining them the patterns and you're explaining the intent and you're going, what are they going to come up with? Maybe, maybe I should, maybe I should be controlling them because, you know, otherwise we're going to have chaos here. But that's, that's the inclination, right? But then if you look at that, really, whose problem is it? It's not the, it's not their problem. No, it's, it's our problem because we have this fear of letting go. And I think back to the, why, why do we have that fear? And it goes back to the system where the system has historically punished failure. It doesn't promote learning. It doesn't promote experimentation. And and that's where I think a lot of the things that we promote get into trouble because we encourage those things and people are like, sounds great, but man, am I scared. Right. But look at here's here's a marquee example. Okay, so let let's take SpaceX versus NASA. Now I don't want to be critical of NASA. They've got so many constraints on them, you know, for you know being 
being the you know public agency and government funding and need to maintain a good image they weren't blowing stuff up on an island exactly they're not they're you know nasa can't blow things up i mean that's bad right if you do that you're going to go to a congressional inquiry exactly and then we got elon musk and spacex and there, how many how many iterations of the Falcon and the Falcon Heavy did they blow up? I think what was it? He was out of money after the third, and leveraged every asset he had to try for the fourth. I mean, he almost went bankrupt. He did, and all of a sudden, there was that most make you know the Falcon Heavy. To me, that was the most amazing thing I ever saw was landing multiple boosters simultaneously. That was a gorgeous video. That that was just insane, and you know. You get the you get basically the director of NASA going. I wish we could do that because yeah. they've got you know. Look at it this way: NASA, you know, SpaceX engine. You tell me there's any difference between an engineer at SpaceX and at NASA? They are probably those rocket engineers are just as smart as each other. They were probably classmates, and you know, it's it's a wonderful example of the way of working. How important that is. You're right. The difference in that example is culture in NASA. They could not, they they couldn't take those risks because their system would punish them relentlessly for the things that they just did on an island on an airstrip. And it was just kind of cool and kind of fun. And let's see how this goes. And that's that, that's that entrepreneurial spirit, right? I mean, it's, it, it's something that we all would love to have. We would all love to be a little more like Elon Musk. It's, it's much more than we'd love to have it. We have to have it because you're, you're right. In that fear, that's the thing, right? We want to do it, but that but is there. We got to figure out how to get through it. Well, yeah, because exactly, there's still that punish, my punish, failure mindset. You can imagine what would have it would have been. It would have been interesting to imagine an alternate universe where, in the design of the SLS, NASA blew up a few of the rockets. Would it have shortened the time it took them to get the SLS launched? Because the day, you know, the day, you know, you remember Elon Musk when he blew up, blew up, was blowing up rockets. You say, "Great, that was amazing data that we gathered." Because that's what engineers need. You know what's interesting about it, Steve? I think that if NASA did blow some stuff up, right, and if they did celebrate it, it'd be all over the news. And I think what's so cool about SpaceX, they have commoditized spaceflight. Conversely, the shuttle launch, everyone was a risk. We lost interest, right? They didn't go up that often, but we lost interest. SpaceX is launching rockets constantly. That Florida coast is packed. People want to, they want a little piece of that. And so I think all of the things that we fear in terms of risk and failure and all of that, people love it. They love that story. They, they are less interested in perfection because nothing's perfect. None of us is perfect. We're all messy. And we can relate to that. Exactly. And that, that distinguishes between, you know, sort of our architecture as a compliant architect, as a compliance officer versus architect enabling fast experimentation. What, what does it take to be able to do that? You already said it. It begins with an L it's the leadership. And right. And so like in this context, what is leadership? It's courage. You've got to have the courage to fight for the teams, to have those broad guardrails, to run those experiments. You've got to have the courage to push back and push the bounds of what we're willing to try. We've got to have the courage to say, listen, if you ever want to go faster, we've got to invest in our foundations that will allow us to speed up in the future. Well, this, this goes back like a personal example. And this is years before SAFE. Turn the clock back to 2000. And I was brought into a company to help them develop. A- Wait, just for context. In 2000, you were brought into a company. I was in high school. I just wanted to bring that up for context. That was not nice. I am really feeling very old here. <laughs> Nothing but love, Steve. Well, on my personal bio, I always say, you know, if you, rem- if, if you remember TTL and PDP 11s uh, and programmed in Fortran, you're probably in my age demographic. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was probably one of those kids that you didn't trust. <laughs> you probably, you probably were. Well, actually that brings up a really great story because I was, I was, you know, for 2000, I was 40 years old and I was brought in to this company that made cellular telephone billing systems. And those are really complex systems. 
and they have and they're real time. They have to integrate with the tel- the telephony network. They have a very high res- performance requirement. That's actually really interesting. So you say that I very well may have been one of those kids because my first gig was working on a billing and OSS system for a wireless company. Yeah. So I was brought into this company and, you know, it, it turned out that I was asked, they were having real problems. Um, they had accumulated so much technical debt. They were having real problems meeting their, responding to their customer needs. And so I was looking at how do we change the architecture of their system such that we can be far more responsive to their customer needs. Because it was a big problem. It was they were lo- they were losing work because it took them too, far too long to be able to. Were do they that. trying to migrate from some sort of a mainframe to a Web 2.0? No, this was very high performance uh, mainframe type processors running under this, but uh, this was very much like I said, almost near, a near embedded system, and it was usually the performance back end to a customer or subscription system. So here I am. I make this proposal, and all of a sudden they go, "Das ist gut." It was, this is in Germany. And so I ended up becoming the, the systems engineer for, for, this, for this system. And here's the problem. I know next to nothing about their system. I don't know anything about the architecture of this system. I do know good architectural principles, and I do know what I want to, and I do know what I want to achieve. And I've got all these young kids, and they are experts on the system. So, you know, it's very much, you know, it's very much analogous to the experience that David Marquet had, right? He had intimate knowledge of the Olympia because that was the submarine he was training for. And then he gets thrown onto the Santa Fe, which he knows nothing about. He's not the technical expert anymore. And that was the situation I was in. I knew good architecture. He knew, knew what it meant to be a good submarine commander, but I did not know the technical details of their system. He did not know the technical details of the Santa Fe. So he could not lead from, I am the smartest person in the room. Now I had to go, how do I empower these people around me to do their job and, and put the guardrails on them such that we can be very quick? So I drew out on a whiteboard in the center of our team area. We, are, we first re, we reorganized into teams. So we, had, we created stable teams. We had four-week iterations. We integrated every four weeks. We demonstrated value. We had the equivalent of a you know, system PI in Which many just ways. For- Context, right? At that point in time, four weeks was lightning fast. Four weeks was lightning fast. And we implemented so many of the practices that would be familiar to a safe officiando. But I was able to delegate. You know, I was I was able to provide enough context. I was able to provide enough intentional architecture that I could unleash the creativity of these teams. And they were, you know, first of all, they stepped up whenever they had issues. We would talk it out on a whiteboard. And this was a unique way of them working. They had never had a situation where they were they were free to design. And it, it took a little bit of pushing on my part or encouragement sure. to get them there. But we were moving at a speed that surprised our, and shocked our, our patrons. Steve, I think you just inadvertently tie, tied a nice bow on this, right? So we've talked a lot about architecture and we've talked a lot about leadership and those qualities. And I think what I just heard you say is that no matter the context, right? The keys to successful leadership, whether it's change leadership, architectural or otherwise, it comes down to having the courage to do what needs to be done and having the humility to say, maybe I don't know all of the things and I'm going to empower the people that do. It's kind of it, man. That's, that's the theme of all that we do. Lead from the front, be humble. Exactly. I think ultimately that... The, be- the greatest quality of a coach, mentor, is to be humble. And it goes back to my old joke about what is it my job to- is to work with absolutely brilliant people who know everything about their systems. And that I, that is an aspect, to have respect for the people because they are the experts in their system. And most people, they just need some help you know, to all of a sudden make that, have the practices that unleash the creativity, that they've got the freedom to experiment and they've got the guardrails and they, and that we can have the fast learning cycles. And yes, maybe we'll blow up a few boosters, but we'll learn. And ultimately we will be able to make progress faster and therefore less costly than other approaches where, you know, as an architect, I'm directing everybody and everybody's waiting for me to approve their work. Steve, I appreciate you. You know, I, I gotta say over the last year and change, I've learned so much from you and I know you have so much more to offer the folks listening than just what we've talked about, right? And it's been a good conversation. 
Where can folks go to find more of your ideas, more of your musings and writings? Where can they find more about Steve? I've got a badly laid out website, uh, steveadolf.com. So there's some blog posts there that are getting a little stale. I've got, I've got to get back to blogging. Uh, so that's one place. Uh, you can go to Google Scholar. Uh, I've got a number of um, papers that I've, you know, some of them are academic, so they're real snoozers, but uh, other pa- there's other pa- papers and presentations that I've done at various conferences uh, on the topic of architecture and various other archi- agile architectures. I love it, Steve. We'll link all that in the show notes. It's been a good convo, man. Thanks for your time. Adam, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this. All right. Take care. You too. Thanks for listening to our show today. Be sure to check out the show notes and revisit past episodes at scaledagile.com slash podcast. Relentless improvement is in our DNA, and we welcome your suggestions for the show. If you have something to share, send us an email at podcast at scaledagile.com.